All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. So uh, thanks, everybody, for attending our talk. Um, I'm James Masters. Uh, I've been with Kroger for about 13 years, uh, eight of those in an ops platform role, and uh, five of those in uh, security. Uh, and I'm Ted. I'm going to talk. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't expect to laugh on that, actually. Uh, so uh, I've been uh, doing software development for 20 years. Uh, I've been doing a lot of cloud stuff for the last four years. And I've been with uh, Kroger for a little over five years. So uh, who is Kroger? Uh, it's, uh, it's a very large uh, grocery store chain, uh, basically. We have a um, jewelry business and other things as well. Uh, but uh, we're coming up on 400,000 uh, associates. Uh, and uh, I thought another interesting fact was uh, over 200 million meals donated uh, by Kroger. So. And uh, you may say, well, how have I never heard of Kroger? Um, we go by a lot of different banners, so here's a whole bunch of them. Uh, in California, might, you might know Kroger as Ralph's. So I'm going to take a couple minutes and kind of lay out the background of our journey to Cloud Foundry. Uh, I, th I think that the place that makes sense to kind of draw that line at the beginning is just our, our virtualization initiative. So it's not as exciting as it used to be. I mean, it's just something we do now. You have a virtualization first strategy. It's just the de facto way that we do things. But I think our scale is worth noting. Um, you know, we have over 40,000 VMs in our environment. Uh, we're 90, upwards of 90% virtualized, so a pretty large environment. Um, with, uh, we brought in Lab Manager in around 2010. And uh, that was kind of the first foray we took into, into exposing some of that infrastructure via a self-service portal so that our developers and you know, business partners and things could go in and uh, request infrastructure themselves and get a VM and then, you know, customize it and, <clears throat> and things. That, uh, that was great. That was well-received by our, by our company. And, uh, but that had challenges with it, right? I mean, it, you know, as a, as a dev, you had to go in and still kind of configure all your middleware and configure you know, load your database, load the right version of whatever, you know, whatever Java you're using. Um, where I think we kind of upped our game was uh, with uh, vCloud Director and uh, vCenter Orchestrator, which we rolled out in 2013. And there we started trying to steer people away from creating special flowers, right? Uh, instead of customizing something and getting it ready and, and then holding on to it forever, uh, we, we tried to encourage teams to uh, help us write some code in Orchestrator to, you know, get your VM to the point that you needed it to be, and then put, you know, put that in source control as well so that it could be managed and maintained by, by more people than just the couple people involved in doing it initially. Uh, and that, that really took off, and then people started saying, okay, we see what you're doing in test dev, um, that's great, we want to start doing that in production, right? And we realized quickly that uh, kind of kicking that ball down the road as, the, as it was, we would be able to deploy things quickly. Um, but the, the hard part is not really deploying systems, right? The hard part is, is managing them going, them going forward, uh, plumbing those up to the rest of your infrastructure. Apparently my virus definitions are up to date. And, uh, <laughs> and then deprovisioning those systems, right? So uh, you know, getting them online is one thing, but, but managing that life cycle is, is another. Um, that's kind of the point where Ted and I, so Dev and Ops, kind of started working more together in, in our teams as well. To, uh, you know, Ted said, you're doing all this orchestration. You have this capability to expose infrastructure this way. He brought to the table, he said, you know, we've been writing uh, automation code as well. So what happens if we marry the two, feed in a few parameters into a, an orchestrator process, and out shoots a running environment with an actual application deployed. Uh, so kind of our first attempt at a CF push, if you will, uh, internally developed. Um, we kind of presented that to our business partners and everybody, and everybody's excited about that, right? Ted's boss, uh, director of architecture, kind of said, that's, uh, that's awesome what you guys have done, now stop. <laughs> and we're like, well, you know, this, this is great, what are you talking about? He's like, there are other people working on this problem. There are other people contributing to doing this. We want you solving other problems and, and doing you know, other things. So that's kind of how we got into Cloud Foundry in, in about 2014. Um, our experience with that has been very positive and it's allowed us to focus on other problems within our company. So not only orchestrating the provisioning of systems and middleware and, and uh, databases and things like that, all that's still important, 
but to focus on you know, even orchestrating an entire project initiation, right? Orchestrate source control uh, repo creation and things like that. And that's um, kind of what Ted's gonna get into here in a minute. Uh, we, we call it our Kroger Internal Cloud Initiative. And uh, so Ted's gonna talk about that here for a minute. All right. Uh, so yes. <clears throat> a little context on that. Uh, why did we do this uh, from a, a business per perspective? Uh, we, uh, we really wanted to consolidate platforms. Kroger is uh, over 125 years old. Uh, we've collected a few different uh, system setups uh, over time. So uh, we're looking for a way to, to standardize that. Uh, we also need elastic scaling. Uh, our business has announced that uh, they intend to grow by two and a half times the current size. Uh, so from 100 billion to 250 billion, that's a, that's a lot of scale. Um, and at present, we, we don't scale very gracefully. Uh, so we were looking for that. Uh, and of course, uh, from the DevOps perspective, we really wanted to um, adopt a lot of automation and quality uh, in our processes. So um, what were some of the requirements for that? Uh, we wanted to make sure we had a, a system that would support 12-factor uh, as a way to write cloud-native applications. Um, and we also wanted to embrace uh, the infrastructure as code mantra. Uh, hopefully, these things sound very familiar to you. Uh, we wanted to scale horizontally, so uh, specifically in scaling. Uh, we had found that vertical scaling uh, tops out, uh, and that's awkward. So uh, horizontal scaling is a much better approach. Uh, and we also had the requirement that uh, we, we need to be able to run internally, but uh, we also want to be able to move uh, to a public cloud uh, or run a hybrid of the two. All right, so uh, this is now uh, what I'll call the novel approach, uh, I think, that we're taking. Uh, we've said it, it's great that we can provision out um, environments with Cloud Foundry very rapidly, but what does it take to get a new project off the ground? When, when we say, okay, we've green-lighted a brand new project, what does a team need? Well, they need some code uh, to start with, right? What, what's their base uh, setup of code? Uh, they need ALM tooling. We really want them to use things like uh, source code control. Hopefully, there's agreement on that one. Uh, and issue tracking and continuous integration uh, and all that good stuff. And then uh, they also really need environments. Uh, we use a, a, an agile methodology where we demo every two weeks, basically, to our business. So in order to hit that first two-week mark, we really need environments. Uh, and in the past, it took uh, significantly longer to get environments. But we wanted to make all this uh, very, very easy for our teams to, to have and, and get going with. So um, we borrowed or, or forked uh, the uh, initializer project from Spring. Um, how many people have uh, seen uh, initializer or start.spring.io? OK. Uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to go check it out. Um, it's, uh, you can just go to start.spring.io. Uh, and basically what it does is you type in a few parameters and you get uh, uh, code out of it, right? It gives you a base set of code. Uh, and it's, it's really uh, clever the way it's configured. It's a great start to the, the project. So um, with that, it required very little work on our part uh, besides just forking the, their, their code to, to get the, the code to spit out that we needed. Um, we have uh, modified that a bit to make it uh, uh, Kroger friendly. So we know we have certain... Uh, logging requirements and things like that, standard things across all our projects that we want, to, want teams to have. Uh, then uh, next up, we, we started doing uh, um, enhancements to the initializer to be able to script out the creation of uh, source code control. Uh, so when the script runs, it creates uh, a stash repo. We use stash uh, for our Git repository. Uh, and it goes ahead and checks in the code that was just created into the stash repo. Uh, it creates uh, our continuous integration builds, uh, and it sets them up with the best practices right from the start. We know we want our teams to do uh, continuous builds. We want them to have sonar builds to check code quality, all that stuff. Uh, we want them to continuously deploy out to the dev environment, so, uh, and then have a progression where it goes from dev to test to stage to prod. Uh, we found that going straight to prod, not a best practice. Uh, so uh, if we want them to do all these things, we really need to, it, it makes it much easier for them if we just put that all out there from the start. So uh, we set up uh, Team City that way, uh, and then uh, Jira for issue tracking, uh, and a couple other things. Uh, and then uh, we go ahead and we make a call to Cloud Foundry and say, okay, uh, for a given blueprint, give us a database, uh, so MySQL, uh, give us a messaging, uh, Rabbit, uh, and then uh, go ahead and take that new artifact that was built on Team City and push it out to uh, Cloud Foundry uh, and have it running out there. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, someone said to the project team, hey, uh, we've got this new project we want you to start. And 10 minutes later, they've got code, ALM tooling, and their environments, and they're ready to go. Right? So 
what does that actually look like? So here you can see um, when we forked uh, Spring Initializer, uh, we did some pretty fancy coding. We put Kroger in front of uh, Spring Initializer up there. Uh, pretty proud of that. Um, so uh, I did uh, cut out some of the, the fields uh, that we have up there just to fit it on the slide. Uh, but you can see the team just basically fills in their project name. Uh, and then on the, the right side, that's where we've added in uh, the, hey, what middleware do you need? Do you need messaging for this solution or database? They just check boxes. Uh, and then which ALM tools do you need? Uh, and they check off those. And then uh, when they click the generate project button, uh, it goes, it runs, and does all those things that I was talking about. Uh, and then they, they get their links to everything, right? So it says, uh, hey, here's where your, your source code's at um, to check out, uh, where your continuous integration builds are set up. Uh, issue tracking, uh, and even your link to Cloud Foundry of, hey, where can I go find my brand new apps that are out there? So, uh, and then what does that look like on Cloud Foundry? This might look familiar. Uh, it's just, hey, you've got your project out there running uh, in a SQL database in the Rabbit, uh, and because of the magic of Cloud Foundry, it's already got the security credentials provisioned, injected into the application, uh, and it's all ready to run. So. So what did we have to do uh, to get to this point? Um, one of the things uh, was uh, defining reference architectures. Uh, if you can spin all this stuff up, uh, but nobody's going to support it. Oh, wait, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> so uh, reference architectures, we said, let's start with just a basic one, um, app server database uh, messaging. That's uh, kind of a typical one that we use. But uh, we have plans to create additional blueprints or reference architectures uh, to handle scale out, right? So if we give the team uh, Rabbit and Cassandra and then the ability to push out to Cloud Foundry, now suddenly we have a very scalable app uh, that was automatically provisioned for them. Uh, next up, we had to get uh, operations buy-in. So if we spin up all this great stuff and uh, nobody's willing to support it, uh, it's going to be a very short flight. So um, we also needed to get uh, our developers to embrace 12-factor coding principles. This is a general Cloud Foundry thing, right? If, if they are going to write and assume that they can you know, put things on the file system and they're going to stay there, uh, they're going to have problems, right? So uh, that's uh, the journey uh, where we're providing education to our developers to get there. Uh, centralized logging, uh, this one's also really key. Uh, we were excited to see Loggergator and a way to, to get logs out of Cloud Foundry, um, but I pretty quickly figured out that if someone calls and said they had a, a problem an hour ago uh, and I go to Loggergator, I can tail the logs and see, or I can see the last 100 messages, but an hour ago is long gone, right? So centralized logging was a really key thing to, to put in place to have uh, a place to dump all those logs. Uh, and then uh, an authentication pattern. So uh, we had standard security practices for user authorization to applications. Uh, Cloud Foundry um, is a, a new challenge. Uh, you don't know your IP addresses of the servers that are out there. So uh, we had to work through um, you know, kind of how to move to a token-based model uh, to deal with that. So uh, what's our experience? We actually had some of these ideas uh, earlier on. So when James was talking about uh, our, our VCO uh, excursion, um, we knew we wanted to do some of this stuff. VCO was a really great tool to achieve some of that. Uh, but then we found out pretty quickly that uh, it turns out it's complex to build Cloud Foundry. Uh, so so uh, um, we, we started on this journey. As soon as we brought uh, Cloud Foundry in-house, uh, suddenly it became much, much easier. Like the, the provisioning script, I don't know how many lines of code was that? Yeah, uh, like 18. Yeah, 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 18 lines of code to, to get a, a database, messaging middleware, and an app server. So it's, we knew it would be simpler, but it was still kind of amazing to actually yeah. see that. Um, and then uh, we, we've also found that uh, uh, in our Cloud Foundry experience that the, the CLI uh, has been a great help. We were able to take that and hook that into our continuous integration server uh, very easily, and that gave us the ability to do uh, blue-green deployments. It did take a, a little bit of work uh, to get to that point, but once we got there, uh, our business was loving it. Suddenly, we could push updates to stuff, uh, and they didn't even see uh, the updates happening. It was zero downtime deploy, so uh, they really liked that. And in some of our situations, that's really critical where we can't really take the systems offline. Uh, and sometimes uh, they would wait uh, a long, long time to get an enhancement, months and months before they'd actually say, yes, we're willing to take the enhancement. Uh, so uh, we can see that in the future with having a automated process to provision out the team and having a standard structure to their, their whole deployments and all that, uh, that we intend to give teams 
blue-green uh, deployment capability right from the start with the, the provisioning. Yeah, and we, we've gone into this with one of our most business critical applications too as a, as a POC. So we're kind of starting with the, the lowest common denominator, making sure this is a robust and available platform. Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah, that, that's the, the group that's particularly uh, pleased with the zero downtime deploy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, another lesson that we've learned in doing this is that the uh, delete all script uh, is really uh, an important component. So um, I will say, <laughs> given that it's a, <laughs> a very critical yeah. system, I was a little nervous the first time I hit that delete all script. Uh, uh, even though, you know, first we ran it in lower environments, it, it's still, you know, to think of the environments as transient, you, you still, they're, they're still kind of like pets to me. I know, I know I'm not <laughs> supposed to keep them as pets, but uh, that first time running the delete all was a little nerve wracking. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that taught me the first good lesson of the delete all script is that I thought we had everything infrastructure as code. Uh, well, I was wrong, right? So we tried to bring uh, up the environment again, and I was missing pieces. So that script taught me a very valuable lesson. Uh, and then as it turns out, the problem we were having was a, um, a problem of migrating from one version to the next, right? Is there any value to the business in solving that problem of just getting to the new version? No. So destroy it all with the delete all, bring up the nice clean infrastructure as code script, your environment's provisioned, uh, and, and you saved all that time. And I think currently to do five microservices, it's taking like mm -hmm. four minutes to provision everything out uh, for us. So it's, it's not even worth thinking about, oh, could it be an issue with this? Um, so, and, and then also, if people know that uh, you're packing that delete all script, uh, they make sure that everything goes into the infrastructure's code, right? Because otherwise, it's gone on the next uh, run of it. Yeah, and so, some of our VCO, VCD stuff I talked about before, uh, while, while not a lot of it went all the way to production, <clears throat> I think it did a, a lot to at least start getting that mindset into people's mind that, you know, don't, don't create, again, special pets that you're going to care for over years in our private cloud. Yeah, and so part of the uh, delete all script and the blue-green uh, process to get there, we found that we had to script out uh, our creation of user-provided services as well. So we really tried to capture everything in source code control and script it all, um, which was a little bit of uh, extra work at the front side, but boy, it saves a lot of time on the back side. All right, so what are the, the benefits that we're seeing? Well, uh, we have this philosophy of make it easy to do the right thing. Uh, and so with this whole process of, hey, I start up a project and it's got the, uh, all the pieces that I need to run my project, uh, it, it becomes almost like an executable SDLC or software development lifecycle. And so it puts the teams on the right path uh, from the very start. Uh, and we've found that in this process, teams tend to follow that process. Uh, uh, when it's so easy to do, uh, why go make trouble, right? They just, they go use, uh, use it and they focus on the business functionality, which is really where they should put their focus. Uh, and then we've seen uh, uh, additional benefits where if we know that we wanna push them in the direction of doing automated functional testing, uh, that becomes so critical with testing out your newly provisioned environments, that if we provision them out, their code and all their stuff, and we give them a functional test harness right from the start, and we've got the builds on the continuous integration server that are running the, the functional tests against uh, a, an environment, then it's a lot more likely that they adopt functional testing. Right? So, um, and I fully expect, too, that we'll realize uh, more benefits as we go uh, with this, because we had done something similar on the code side long ago. Um, it was very similar to Spring Boot in that it was a, an opinionated framework stack that, that we gave our developers. Uh, and we found that uh, um, we were using that for a while, and then we had a new employee came in and, and he said, uh, hey, how come you guys aren't running Sonar, right? Uh, and we're like, oh, uh, no good reason. Uh, and so in the span of uh, two weeks, he had migrated all of our projects so that they were now reporting uh, their results and we were getting trending on code coverage and sonar. And that was all due to the fact that we, we had a very common setup uh, across of our, our projects. And since we are now going to have a common setup across our code, ALM, and environments, I'm expecting that there are benefits we haven't even seen yet uh, that will come across. So uh, continuous delivery, so that's another one that uh, we're, we're working on. Uh, we're, not, we're not really there yet for the most part. Or, Maybe some small, small pockets uh, have achieved it uh, um, uh, so far. But uh, we can see that we can all work on that problem together. When, when we go to solve how deployments go, uh, one team can pick that up from another team because we're using a common way to approach it. Uh, and then infrastructure as code. Uh, when our process runs, uh, the, the initializer plus uh, process, um, 
we're taking it and not only provisioning out the environments, but we capture the, the scripting that was used to do that, and uh, we put that into the team source code control. So if the team needs like a, a UAT environment, um, you know, I don't know, how many have people run into that problem where you're getting close to the release date and now suddenly you need environments for UAT and performance testing and security audits and all that stuff, and suddenly there's environment contention. Well, if we've got this uh, just as a script, you can spin up the environments you need for that temporary time and then tear them down after you're done. Uh, so it really uh, uh, undoes that bottleneck and it gets people into the mantra of infrastructure as code. All right, so uh, benefits uh, for managers, uh, much, much faster project provisioning. Um, so I think uh, one of the key things here is that we can start to try out um, concepts. When it takes months to stand up hardware and get it going, you, th you limit down the number of uh, concepts that you're gonna try out because of that. If you can spin this up in 10 minutes and, and let a agile team go at it for a couple sprints, then uh, it's, it's much, much easier to uh, give that a shot and try out some ideas. And then when it doesn't pan out, it's also easier to reclaim those resources and put them back in the pool and, and keep going. Uh, higher consistency. So uh, when uh, we get started with projects, it's, it's much more known how much time it's going to take to get going. And then also, since there's consistency across the projects, I can move developers around and they're very comfortable with the environment because it's consistent. Uh, and it's our path to consolidate platforms. Uh, if, if we've been growing all these special snowflake platforms like crazy, how do we get to a more common platform? Well, if we've got just a drop down list uh, from our initializer that says, hey, you know, do you need just a, a small scale web app or do you need a, a scale out web app or just a couple blueprints basically, then uh, we're gonna see much less uh, proliferation of, uh, of environments. Or at least that's my hope. We're at the start of this journey. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, and uh, auditable, uh, you can see basically uh, who's starting up projects, who's provisioning out uh, um, resources and all that stuff. Uh, so it gives you a little more control uh, on the projects. Right. How are we doing on time? Good deal. Seven minutes, okay, great. Uh, so uh, questions then? Oh, and uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>
Yeah, currently uh, that is a pure VMware stack underneath. So vSphere, vCD, vCO, and then actually on the front end, a uh, simple portal for some of that stuff is VMware Service Manager. Uh, so we are looking at, at like VIO, we're looking at OpenStack as well. Um, we have played around with provisioning to other hypervisors as part of that to see how that works, but, uh, but what you saw today is all vSphere based, at least from the infrastructure side, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, basically, it's just using the, the CF CLI uh, to, to script that out. Uh, so, um, we know, like, on a given app project, uh, which microservices we deploy out there. Um, and so, a lot of it is just, like, CF uh, delete app. Uh, use the uh, minus R option, otherwise you can leave routes out there, uh, which can create a bit of a mess. Um, but, and then, uh, as I mentioned, we have some user provided services and things like that, so we clean those up as well. Um, but that, that's really all there is to it. So the, the delete script is, is actually very small in, in creating it. Uh, I think it's the mentality that it yeah. brings is, is the real magic. And, and not maybe not specifically to that question, but, but on some of those, those blueprint deployments that we talked about earlier through VCO and vCloud, you know, those we, right out of the gate, those things blow up in seven days. So, it, it, you know, we just communicate to people using it, hey, make sure it's in source control or whatever got that thing to that state because it's, we're not holding on to it forever. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great one uh, that uh, James had suggested. Uh, when we got people in the mindset of it's transient right from the start, uh, then uh, I can imagine later on it would have been tougher to introduce. But yeah. once you get used to it, then it, it's fine. So. So I've, I've upgraded uh, Ops Manager and Elastic Runtime twice in, in place. Um, we were just talking about this earlier, walking around outside. When we take this beyond, we take this to a more uh, production rollout, and we're still in POC phase, I mean, to be honest with you. We'll, we'll have at least, uh, at least two foundations running, and we want to get you know, people in the mindset of keeping both foundation, apps deployed to both foundations synchronously, so not necessarily replicating them, but just from our CI, CD process, making sure they're consistent. So you know, my thought is that we could almost take foundations in maintenance mode, or you know, kind of make that blue-green deployment process maybe across data center such that it's, not an, it's a, it's a non-event. Um, now we don't have that in place today, that's all just whiteboard and thinking about it, but um, that's, that's my thought on that. Um, so we've had, well, obviously we're doing Cloud Foundry, we're doing a little bit with, with, with its containers. As far as Docker on its own, uh, we have little teams looking at it, you know, uh, me, myself included. Um, I think we're, at least I am, I think we agree on this, most interested in seeing how, do, how Docker will play into Cloud Foundry and how we can use Cloud Foundry to orchestrate Docker containers. Um, you know, we got a couple guys looking at Kubernetes and, and just, again, sort of, Roll your own type things around cloud or around Docker, um, but again, I think some of the things we've learned up to where we got today, and that that is again provisioning containers is like I was at a, one of the presentations here. Really, I think it was that Dr. Nick guy, and he was like, "Oh, congratulations, you've provisioned a container!" Like, woo, you know, and that, that's like that's like the easy part, right? So, I mean, I think that's that's the extent to we're we're looking at, at Docker right now. Um, I think uh, the application authentication authorization model for apps in Cloud Foundry, uh, container isolation within and, and data classification of apps being pushed to CF. I mean, we, we're a highly regulated company, so we have every PCI, DEA, you know, HIPAA, right? And we have that heavily segmented today at, at all layers. Um, so for me, and then my, I started in security as well, so my friends over there in uh, corporate information security are like, just because you have this big VLAN now that you have your cloud foundry running in doesn't mean that you can all of a sudden start just pushing all applications of all kinds of classifications in there. And then on the target systems that are firewall, just open that VLAN up into that zone, right? So those are kind of my, my top concerns. Uh, so just data classification, segmentation, and and the app 
authentication model within CN. Yeah, th those are some uh, very real challenges. Uh, the security teams also like some aspects of this. Uh, as soon as I told them that I wasn't going to log into a box anymore, they were pretty excited about that. Uh, and then uh, also the uh, having the blueprints, right? Uh, that's uh, something where we can say, okay, here's the application stack. It can be vetted very carefully. Um, they're, they're excited about kind of that consistency yeah. uh, as well. So, but uh, what James said is is very very real. Yeah, we're hoping some of the micro segmentation, you know, whether it's NSSEC, we just kind of went through an evaluation of some of those technologies. Um, I, I think that's where they're headed in supporting, you know, micro segmentation at kind of the container level. Uh, so we're very interested in seeing where that goes. Nope, we're done. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks, guys.